Good afternoon. I don't know I was going to have to hold this mic the whole time. <laughs> and that was sort of a weak Giants welcome as there's Giant fans in the house. But what Chad won't tell you is that he's really a Tampa Bay fan, so he, he kind of wishes that this was Rondé, my brother, my twin brother. You are Rondé, aren't you? I am Rondé. I can pretend to be Rondé if you'd like me to. Tiki Barber was drafted in 1997 as a running back out of the University of Virginia and spent all 10 years in the NFL with the New York Giants. He is one of 21 players in NFL history to have gained over 10,000 rushing yards and was selected at three Pro Bowls. As the Giants' all-time leader in both rushing and receiving yards, Tiki retired from the NFL in 2006 at the age of 31. In October of that year, on behalf of their family, Tiki and Rondé made a donation of $1 million to their alma mater. At that event, where the check was presented, the Barber brothers cited their mother's influence, particularly related to academics and civic participation. In his memoir entitled, My Life in the Game and Beyond, Tiki clearly states that football does not define him. So we're here today to find out what really defines Tiki Barber. Welcome to Little Rock. Thank you. Glad to be here. On April 7th, 1975, you were born in Roanoke, Virginia. What name was on your birth certificate? Well, this is an interesting story. Me and my brother, it wasn't actually Roanoke. We grew up in Roanoke, but we were born in Blacksburg, Virginia, which is where Virginia Tech is. My father was a football star there. My mother was a student there. And we were born premature, and we were put in incubators, and we were not very happy to be in those incubators. And I was screaming my head off. And so an exchange student who my mother and father went to school with named me. And that name was Atim Kiambu, which means fiery tempered king. And I think Swahili, I'm not sure. Ronde's is a lot less interesting. His real name is Jamel Oronde, which means firstborn son. So he gets a literal name, I get an abstract name that I don't live up to. And what's your mother's name? My mom's name is Geraldine Brickhouse Barber and her educational background? Well, it's interesting when you think, when I talk about my mother, because the reason that Rondé and I were so adamant about being good students was because of her. Here's a, here's a story about us when we went to college at the University of Virginia. She had graduated from Virginia Tech with a, a degree in business, but always wanted to go back and get her master's degree. And she never had time because her and her husband, my father, split. And so it became about us. It was no longer about her, it became about us. And she did everything in her power to give us a great upbringing, um, but she had to make sacrifices. So when we, went, when we left, we were out of the house, she didn't have to feed us anymore, do our laundry or anything else. She went back to school to get her master's degree. And every week, I mean, almost to a T, she'd call us on Saturday uh, and say, I'm making straight A's, what are you guys doing? And so our influence for education came from her. And the challenge uh, that I always found on the football field, um, uh, playing with my brother, I found also in education because of my mother. And those are the type of things that have shaped me and made sports, but also academics, so important to me. And what's your father's name? My father's name is James Barber. And unfortunately, we have a strained relationship. And in my book, I talk a lot about it because of few experiences that happened uh, when I was little, but also in my last football game. And it's, I guess it's, it's early, but it's, we'll, we'll talk about it. My last football game, my last regular season football game was against the Washington Redskins, which was kind of my hometown favorite. And it was, it was a little bit ironic that I was ending my career playing them. And I had a ridiculously good day. I had 234 yards and three touchdowns in this game. And thank you. And it, and it propelled us into the playoffs. Unfortunately, we, we lost the next week to the Philadelphia Eagles, but that game was special and it sticks in my mind for a variety of reasons. One, um, I scored a touchdown early and I gave the ball to some random guy in the, in, the, in the stands. He was a Giants fan amongst a sea of Redskins fans. And it turns out that two weeks later, I get this ball back. He turn, he's a cop from New Jersey, right around where we practice, and he said, I spent, you know, basically my vacation money to come see you play your last game, 
and you gave me this ball. So it was just a small world, and I signed it, 234 yards, three touchdowns, and this was my first, and I gave it back to him. But after my second touchdown, I had this feeling that, you know, I'm in the zone. Anything I do is, is going to be successful. I can relax a little bit, and I did. And I looked up into the stands, and Redskins fans are screaming like they always did, we hate you, you stink, etc. <laughs> and then it got quiet, and a guy stood up, and he said, your father loves you. And I didn't know what he meant. I didn't know if he was talking about God or if he was talking about my father. Was it my father? I couldn't tell. Um, he was an African-American man. And I realized it wasn't, but it made me think. And so in the midst of this game that had such a significant meaning to me, being my last one, the only thing that I thought about for the rest of that day and really the rest of the week was what was he talking about and what should my relationship with my father be? And in fact, I end my book by talking. Yes, I've done a lot in my short life so far, 33 years. But one thing I know I do need to work on is that relationship because fathers play such an important part in, pe in kids' lives. And I know that now because I have two little boys. And that's a good segue into, uh, in the beginning of Barack Obama's memoir, he does talk about the same thing. He talks about how his father left his family when he was two years old and the significant impact that it had on his life. Being that you reference your father at four years old, how do you think it's formed the way that you are a father? Well, it's formed things in a couple of ways. One, for my kids. Two, for countless other kids that I try to help. And it's, and it's great that we're here at the Clinton School of Public Service because that's what, I, that's what I dedicate my life to. One, with my kids, I know that no matter what I do in my life, and, this, and I experience this as I'm sure all, a lot of you parents here do when you have your first child, you realize in an instant, this is not about me anymore. It's about this child. And literally a year later, I couldn't remember what I used to do before I had kids. You know, what did, how did we used to spend our days or afternoons or what did we go out to dinner, et cetera? And so I have such a focus on what my kids do. Um, I don't want them to play football, but I won't prevent them from playing football. I want them to be polite and say thank you, ma'am and sir. And, and I have to be there to teach them that. Um, but also, when I look in the public service realm that I get involved in, uh, a lot of these kids don't have fathers. And because of that, they feel like s people don't care for them. And all kids want is to be loved and cared for and nurtured and, and shown what to do, sometimes in discipline, sometimes uh, with just encouragement. And so as I go out and I talk to, to children at schools or I get involved with the Robin Hood Foundation, which fights poverty, or the Children's Miracle Network, which provides uh, services to those kids who have illnesses, I think I remember that. And I remember what I didn't have, someone who cared. And so when I talk to them, I talk about caring and how we do care. While, while I'm not your father, I do care like your father. You credit your mother for the many successes that you've had both on and off the football field. If you had to give advice to a young single mother, what would it be? Well, I'll tell you what my mother did. I can't give you that same advice because it might not work for you. Um, but I'll tell you what my mother did. She gave us our independence, but then held us accountable. So what does that mean? That means that she worked three jobs to provide for us and let us do what we wanted to do. But if we messed up, we got the belt. And that tough discipline was something that... Uh, allowed us to remember what was important. And those are the lessons that she taught us about being accountable, about being responsible, about realizing that every decision that you make has a consequence. Um, whether you uh, feel like you don't want to study for a test or whether you feel like going out and doing bad things with your friends, that's your decision. But the consequence will be uh, either great if you do study and get a good grade or severe if you don't and fail. And I, I commend my mom, and I hope as a father now that I send those same ideals to my kids. I want them to have their freedom, but I also want them to make the right choices. And that's, it's a fine line, and a lot of uh, single parents have, uh, have trouble with that because they don't have help. Uh, the other thing that my mother did was pushed us into extracurriculars, which is why I talk about getting involved in sports or the thing that you're, or you find your passion in. Because my coaches, as you know, being a coach, for sing and, and you have kids that have one parent, you become a surrogate uh, as a coach. You become a substitute parent. 
uh, who teach them things. I mean, my, my college coach taught me how to shave. Um, my, 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 my NFL coach taught me about discipline and focusing on minutia. So those type of things that you usually pick up from your father, uh, you, you can pick up from coaches because they become such an important part in your life. There's uh, maybe three distinct uh, things in the book that I remember about how your perspective changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of those was on a bike ride with Rondé. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah. It's, um, I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, as you mentioned. And it was the star city of the South. You used to have a big rail presence with goods and services coming through. But then it kind of died out a little bit. But we all know who Princess Leia is, right? You know, Star Wars. Well, her mother uh, lived in Roanoke. And uh, Debbie Reynolds lived in Roanoke in this enormous house on top of this hill. And as growing up in the valley, you'd look at it and you'd say, oh, wow, I wonder, what, I wonder what the view is like up there. And so one day, me and my brother got on our bikes and we just started riding. And it was like this the whole way. And it was, wasn't hard. It, I mean, it wasn't easy. It was tough to keep our, 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 our will to go. But eventually we made it there. And we got to the top and we're just panning and, and, and saying, wow, I can't believe we did that. And the next question is, so do we go up to the door? And, you know, in our, in our mind, we think Princess Leia is going to be there. Obviously, she wasn't there. Um, but then we turned around, and we looked out over Roanoke. And it was literally the most beautiful sight I'd seen at the time, because the Roanoke Valley is very undulated. There's a lot of hills and valleys and plateaus, and I had never seen it. And all of a sudden, in this instant, I started to realize that, yeah, Roanoke is great, and this is where I grew up, but there is an enormous world out there. I'd never been on a plane. I'd never left uh, southwest Virginia other than to go see my grandmother on the eastern shore. But I started to think about what was possible outside of, of my hometown, and that led us a few years later to decide to go to the University of Virginia, which was a great place for us because there were so many different cultures and people and experiences that we became privy to. And those 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 little moments that happened with my brother that mean nothing to anybody else mean a lot to us. So I, I bet that you and Rondé started playing football at the same time. Yeah. What, when was that? We were eight years old when we first started playing. And really, the only reason we did it was because everybody else was doing it. We wanted to be uh, uh, with our friends, you know, those who we loved to, to do. And they started playing football, so we started playing football. Did you dominate at that point? Well, that was the thing. We were, we were better than everybody else. <laughs> It was funny, Chris Collinsworth, who works, for, works with us on Football Night in America, he gets asked all the time, you know, my kid is starting to play football or, or baseball or whatever it is, and, you know, do you think he has what it takes to get to the next level, to the NFL? And Chris gave this perfectly succinct, and, and, and it's so true of an answer. He said, well, let me ask you this. Do the other parents complain that they have to play against your kid? And if the, if the person says no, then... Chris says, well, then he doesn't have a chance. <laughs> now, many of the people in here, I don't know if they know this, but you were the valedictorian of your high school. Yeah. Uh, so you obviously had more interest in football growing up. What were they? Well, interestingly enough, and you, we were talking earlier about self-discovery and writing a book. I tell everybody, you should just write a book. Whether it gets published or not, just write it. And have someone to talk to about these things in your life because you re-remember things and work things out in your head. For the longest time, and the reason I went, one of the reasons I went to UVA is because I wanted to get into aerospace engineering because I wanted to be an astronaut. And I couldn't figure out why until I, started, until I sat down and started to write this book. And what I realized was that the Challenger blew up when I was in sixth grade or so. And I remember that day in school because we all sat around watching a television uh, in our classrooms. And then obviously this disaster happened and all of our teachers ran out of the room. Obviously, Kristen, Kristen McCullough was on that, was on that um, uh, ship and she was a teacher. And so it affected all of our teachers. And we were sitting in this room as students having no idea what was going on. There was no teachers there, and we were confused. But it started, I, I think, a fascination with me. And, and then a few years later, space camps became big. I don't know if you guys remember those, but space camps became enormous. 
and I always wanted to go to one. Obviously, I, I, we couldn't because we didn't have the, the financial resources. And so uh, as I started to get older and started to think about what I wanted to do in my life, it was to be an astronaut, not a football player, because uh, I didn't know I was going to be a great football player, um, but to be an astronaut. And that's where uh, uh, what led me to UVA. Ultimately, in engineering was too tough, and I went to business school. Um, <laughs> And then I proceeded to not use my degree, but that's okay. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about UVA, because uh, I remember 1995, yep. Virginia, Florida State, nationally yep. televised game. You had a great outing. Tell us a little bit about it. It was the day that made my career as a football player. And your understanding of things evolve as you get older. And I'll tell you a Warwick Dunn story, who I hope I'm going to try to help get him here. Um, after I tell this story, but we played Florida State, which had never lost to an ACC team in 1995. They were ranked number one in the country, and they came to Charlottesville, Virginia to play us, and it was the only game in town. It was Thursday night football, nobody else was playing. And I remember the first series I fumbled, and Florida State went and scored. And obviously the mood and the environment just kind of sucked itself out, and oh, here we go again, Florida State's gonna win. But then the next drive, we got the ball back, and we, we had prepared a lot for this team and knew how to attack them. And when we saw a, a specific instance of a safety coming down, we audible to an option. And the quarterback pitched it to me, and I went 70 yards for a touchdown. And then it was, we believe now. We know we can play with these guys. And ultimately, I had the best day of my college career. I had 311 all-purpose yards and two touchdowns. And we beat them on the last second play. Florida State drove all the way down the field. There were six seconds left. And the way it timed out, uh, uh, worked out, the score was 33 to 28. So they didn't even have to kick the extra point. They just had to score the touchdown, and they win the game. They're on the six-yard line. Um, one play left. What play do you call? They called a direct snap to work done. And we stopped them literally an inch. I mean, less than an inch from the goal line. And I talked to work about that a lot every time I see him, because he was my roommate's brother in Tampa. They got drafted the same year. And Warwick says, you know I scored. I'm like, Warwick, you know you didn't score. Stop, give it up. Bobby Bowden had the greatest quote after the game. He said, you know, these national championships, they kind of work themselves out. Well, today we got worked out. And that's what I always tell Warwick when I see him. But last week, I did a story on Warwick. Um, I don't know if any of you, if you are familiar with Warwick Dunn, but his story is pretty amazing. At age 17, his mother, who was a police officer, was shot and killed, and he was uh, put in a position where he had to help raise his five brothers and sisters with his grandmother while going to college, and it was difficult for him. And so he just wrote a book, and it's a great book. It's called Running For My Life, where he recounts going through counseling, but also going to Angola State Prison in Louisiana to meet the man on death row who shot his mother and how it freed him. And so in reading his book and talking to him, um, November 5th, 1995, was the day of this Florida State game. And he got stopped on the one-yard line or half a quarter-inch line from scoring and keeping their national championships hopes alive. There was something else significantly weighing on his mind that I didn't know about until last week. On that day, one of the men who, was sent, who, who killed his mother was sentenced to die. And so it puts in perspective the game that we play. We think it's the end all be all sometimes, but really it's just a mask of society. Um, there's so many things that happen underneath. We are football players and we're stars, but we're people. We have the same uh, highs and lows and problems that everybody else has. Um, we just have a job that people care about. And so that game, now, while I looked at it as an enormous moment for me in my career, I see it now as, uh, because I have such a good relationship with Warwick, I see it now as just a mask of our lives. And Warwick had so much more to care about than whether or not he got stopped on the quarter inch line that day. But didn't something else happen for you that day too? Well, yeah, and again, in the same vein, I had, I value my friendships like, like nothing else in, in the world. And I always get emotional when I tell this story. 
when I was a freshman or first year, as we called it at UVA, I met this girl. Her name was Lou, and she was she was just a, a light. She was six three, and I was you know five nine. So we had nothing in common. She was white. I was black. Um, but she took care of me because I didn't know how to adjust to college. I'm unproctored for the first time. I never drank in high school. I didn't, I, I didn't know what to expect, and she helped me. And we were as close as could be uh, my first year. And then we fell out of touch. And it's, it was unfortunate because we were so close. The same night, November 5th, 1995, we beat Florida State and 25,000 Virginia alumni and fans students rush onto the field. And amongst this chaos, who should I bump into but Lou? And she jumps and gives me a huge hug. She says, Tiki, I love you. You're awesome. Uh, that was so great. And you know, I, I didn't really pay attention. I wanted to get into the locker room. I said, OK, Lou, great. It's great to see you, too. And I, and I left. And a short time later, she was out hanging out, playing uh, games with some of the fraternities, and they were throwing smoke bombs in each other's houses and rooms. And someone threw one in her. She was sleeping. Um, and her f curtains caught on fire, and she died. And the only thing I ever think about now is that day, after that game, after not seeing her for two years, I didn't give her two seconds just to say, Lou, I love you too. And so now I tell my friends every time, hey, I love you, bro. Even if it's guys, I love you, dude. Um, you know, because you, you never know when your friends are going to go away. So. The 1997 draft was a bifurcation point for you. Although you were drafted by the Giants in the second round, you hated New York City, right? I did. But who loved New York City? <laughs> so. And interestingly, my brother almost got drafted by the Giants as well. If they would have been three picks higher, and the Bucks wouldn't have taken him, I think the Giants would have taken him. And then we would have been happy-go-lucky, hunky-dory. I hated New York City with a passion because I went to New York in 1996, and it was an enormous snowstorm. And coming from Roanoke, I'd never been to a big city like this, much less one that has to deal with a snowstorm. And people are driving in the middle of the roads, Honking, rude, it's freezing, and we got stuck there for five days sleeping in a studio, which is probably the size of the stage, um, with me, my wife, or my girlfriend at the time, my wife, and her sister. And I couldn't wait to leave. And then on draft day, um, I get a call from Jim Fossil. No, I get a call from Pat Hanlon, who ironically, her uncle was the family that adopted Jenny's family when they came over from Vietnam. So it's a small world that we live in. And I said, Jenny, I got a call from Pat Hanlon. And she said, oh, I know that name. Um, but I couldn't, we couldn't figure it out. And then I get on the phone. And someone says, hey, Tiki, this is Jim Fossil. We're going to take you with the next, draft, next pick in a draft. And I have no idea who Jim Fossil is. It was his first year. I didn't know what team he was representing. He just said who he was. And eventually, Jenny said, oh, Pat Hanley is for the Giants. And then I knew I was going to New York, and I almost cried. <laughs> My wife, however, who loves fashion, wanted nothing more to live in New York City. And so that's why we got married, because she wanted to live. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so we came to New York. And I lived in New Jersey for a year. She was still in, in school. And eventually, uh, we made the decision to move into New York City because it was easier for me, these practical decisions. And as men in this room who are married, certain fights you don't fight. So I decide, we decided to live in New York. I commuted out. She stayed in. It was easier for both of us. And I've come to love New York City, and I don't think I'll ever leave because it has a, it's a place with so much energy and opportunity. The reason that I'm where I am today, working for the Today Show and having uh, so many in other interests outside of football is because I lived in New York City and got to meet so many different influential people and realize my power as an athlete, which is to influence some of them. Now, there's no doubt you're one of the best running backs in NFL history, but in your transition, and you, and you referenced Jim Collins, who I love, and Peter Drucker, uh, but in your transition from becoming a good running back to a great one, you also referenced Sean Payton, and now the head coach of the New Orleans Saints, and one of my favorite quotes in your book, 
and I'll paraphrase a little bit. I needed a Sean Payton to recognize my strengths. I actually think that the ability to respond with enthusiasm to someone else's potential is almost as rare as talent itself. Can you expound on that? Very true. In football, we try to make it rocket science, and it really isn't. And what Sean Payton was able to do was look at his players and say, you're good at this, you're good at this, you're good at this. Forget my idea of a system. We're going to let you do this, you do this, and you do that. And he did that for me because I was just an average player until he came along and said, you are a misdirection runner. We can fool people by making them think you're going this way and come back this way. And that's all we ever did when, with me. We had a thunder and lightning backfield, me and Ron Dane, who I'm sure some of you guys remember from Wisconsin. And that year made my life um, as a football player go from average to good. And I commend him for giving me that chance because it was harder um, than a lot of people think to have expectations to be good and then not be good. It's harder than people think to put every single ounce of yourself into something and still not be good enough. And that's a lot of what football is. And we don't, a lot of people don't see that um, because you only focus on the stars, but there's a lot of people that are below the, the radar that are putting every bit of themselves but aren't good enough. Um, Sean Payton gave me a chance to find my potential and, and, and become a, a, a good player. From there, uh, I always tried to find ways to reinvent myself. Um, one was in the media stuff that I would do off the field because I didn't want to be wedded to the game of football. But two, I knew I had to get stronger. And we talked about uh, upstairs before. I met this guy. His name is Joe Carini. And it's one of the other books that I've written. It's called... Uh, pure hard workout, um, who is a caricature of a man. Have you guys ever seen the World's Strongest Man competitions? Well, he did those. And he trained me for three years, pulling tires, uh, picking up, you know, 400 pounds and walking with it, um, picking up heavy bags and just trying to stand up, lay on your ground and try to stand up with a heavy bag without using your hands, those type of things that built functional strength. And I'd always tell him, Joe, this is too hard. I can't do this. And he'd say, life is hard. Do it. <laughs> and so I would do it. Don't think about the weight. Just do it. Don't think about the circumstances. Just do it. And it became a lesson in life for me. And I carried over to the, to the NFL games where I would look at, say, a Ray Lewis or a Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense and say, God, these guys are good. I don't know if I can do that. Life is hard. They're hard. Just do it. And my mentality as a football player changed because of a workout. And um, I think looking forward, that mentality has stuck with me. And it's why I've been able to, to do a lot of different things because I don't look at things as hard. I look at, them, I look at things as um, doable no matter what the circumstances are. Which led to 2005, your best season, Yeah. right? Would you say that? Mm, I think, Close. yeah, 2005 was my best. Okay. But some of your biggest losses yeah. off the field. Yeah. Not many players uh, have the bond that you did with the co-owners of the respective yeah. teams. Describe their influence on your life. Yeah, 05 was my best season. That was 1,800 yards rushing and 500 receiving. And Coach Coughlin, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> I think it's second all-time to Marshall Falk. That was a great fantasy year yeah, for many people. It was. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Um, Wellington Mara, who was one of the originators of the National Football League and really championed revenue sharing, which allows little markets like Green Bay, um, Buffalo, who don't have the revenue from advertising, to stay in, in, in business because they all share. It's, it's, it's actually socialism in its biggest form, but it works for the NFL. Uh, Bob Tisch, who was a New York icon who came from nothing, um, to own one of the largest corporations in America, Lowe's Corp, hotels and entertainment, et cetera. Um, these two guys shaped my life in significant ways. And unfortunately, in 2005, we knew they were both sick. Um, Wellington had melanoma, and Bob had a brain tumor. And Coach Coughlin would say at the beginning of the year, because we all kind of knew that this year that they would pass away, we are the team of record for our two owners' lives. And that's something that really hit me uh, deeply. 
uh, because I had such a good relationship with them. And so in 2005, every game that I played, I played for them because that's the only way I could thank them for what they had done for me. And it came to a head with Wellington when we played the St. Louis Rams, I believe it was, and we were losing and we had no business winning the game. But you know what? We came back and we did win. And it was the last game that he saw. And as a result, Coach Coughlin gave us Monday off, which he never does. Monday afternoon, I get a call from Ronnie Barnes, who is our head trainer, and he said, the, the Mara family is requesting you uh, come visit them up in Greenwich, Connecticut. And so I, I drove up and uh, had a chance to sit down with Wellington and talk to him privately and, and thank him. And he was, he was halfway up to heaven by then. Um, but I got a chance to thank him and say, I appreciate the lessons that you've taught me about family and, 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 and the place of God um, in our lives, but also uh, the importance of organizations, this organization. And the next morning, he passed away. And it, it was a sad day for me. And in fact, the fact that both of the, our owners died that year, the game lost a little bit for me. My passion for it went away a little bit. But that week was interesting. That Friday, we went to a funeral, and, you know, if you can say this and not sound harsh, it was a perfect day for a funeral. It was a low cloud cover. It was a gray day, but it was crisp, and it was perfect. And we went to the eulogy, and his son, John Mayer, gave this perfect representation of who he was. And then we went out back to New Jersey because Coughlin Coughlin has to practice every day, no matter what. And we practiced. And... Right when we were stretching, there was this, this sphere of light. The sun just started peeking through, right? And it was only open for about 10 minutes. It was right down on our practice field. And I said, Coach, that's, uh, that's Wellington looking down on us. And he said, you know what? I think you're right. That Sunday, we played one of our biggest rivals, which is the Washington Redskins. And the first play of the game, I knew that I was set up to do what I should have done which was thank him. I had a 59-yard run down the left side, first play of the game. Later in the second quarter, I had a 57-yard run down the, down the other sideline. And it was shaping up to be one of my best days in my career. But Timmy McDonald, who was Wellington's grandson, came up to me and said, dude, old man, you're going to keep getting caught, you're going to score me a touchdown. <laughs> and so I said, Timmy, before this day is over, I will score you a touchdown. And so late in the third quarter, we are on the six-yard, four-yard line or so, and we call a draw. And at this point, I have 202 yards rushing. And they give me the draw. Sean Taylor jumps at me. I jump over him and dive into the end zone, score a touchdown. I get up and I blow a kiss like I always did when I scored touchdowns, and I dropped the ball. But then I remembered real quickly. I turned around and I picked it up. I ran over to the sideline. I took that ball. I gave it to Timmy, and I said, Timmy, this is for you, this is for your family, this is for your grandfather. I love you guys and I thank you for everything you've done for me. And then I took myself out of the game. This was, you know, I could have had a 300 yard day that day, but I realized that the only way that I could thank Wellington Mara and his family was to have that day, that game, that performance on that day, which was a day that we were honoring him. And I took myself out of the game and said, I'm done. I've done what I came to do. And it was, it was a beautiful moment for me. And, and people ask me, you, know, you had a you know, 95-yard run against Oakland. You had the 200 and, you know, 200, 234-yard day against the Redskins. That day was the one that I always talk about because that's the one that meant the most. Bob Tisch was the person that introduced you to big-time philanthropy. That's what yeah. you say in your book. Yeah. And you seemed moved by the thought of giving back. Yeah. What does giving back mean to you at this stage in your life? Well, Bob, I'll, 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 real quickly, I'll talk about Bob. Bob started an organization called Take the Field, which, which gave um, schools that didn't have facilities for sports these great state-of-the-art public-private partnerships, um, athletic facilities. And he got me involved early on. He kind of took me under, my, under his wing, which was, um, which was rare, because I'm, here I am from Virginia, you know, a young black kid living in New York City, and he's Bob Tisch, who's this icon of New York uh, philanthropy and business. Um, but he, he took a liking to me. In fact, when my wife was pregnant for the first time, his assistant came to me and said, oh, Bob wants to say congratulations. 
I'm like, don't say congratulations for what? And he said, for your baby. I was like, how, no, how did Bob know that I'm, that I'm having a baby? Because we hadn't told anybody. And so I saw Bob, and I asked him. He said, Tiki, and he talked in this way, Tiki, there's not much that goes on in this city that I don't know about, <laughs> especially when it comes to my players. And I, I was fortunate that I got an opportunity through his son to speak at his uh, memorial service. Uh, I went and sat Shiva with him when he was ill uh, after, after he had passed away. I went and sat with him when he was ill, sat Shiva after he passed away, and his son asked me to speak at his eulogy. And I did, and I got up, and I didn't prepare anything. All these speakers who had known Bob for his entire life knew, you know, said, had all these great stories, and I hadn't prepared anything, and I didn't know what I was going to say. And finally, I got up there, and I just started talking about what he meant to me. And, and I said, you know, he's accomplished a lot. He's done a lot of great things in his life. But in my mind, the greatest thing he's done is that he took uh, a young African-American kid from southwest Virginia and made him feel Jewish. <laughs> and it cracked the whole room up. And it, it, it was a great moment because that's what Bob would have wanted. He would have wanted people to feel happy that he had passed on. And it's interesting because when I talk about Wellington, I get a little sad. When I talk about Bob, I get happy. And I, don't, I don't know why that is, but that's just, that was his personality. But what he instilled in me philanthropically was what I alluded to early on that we are only as powerful as what we do for other people. And it's a res not only it's, it's a joy to do, but it's a responsibility to do. When you're given something and you're given a power, whether it be monetarily or of influence, it's, it's your responsibility to, to do those things that further society. It's the same reason that athletes, whether they like it or not, are role models because people are looking at you uh, for, the right, for the right example. It's the same reason politicians are role models because people are looking for you uh, for the right direction in our country. And it's something that I take responsi a, a huge responsibility for, and Bob showed me why. Uh, because you can help so many people by doing things um, that really aren't a huge strain on your life. Um, and if you go that extra mile, not only will somebody else see the benefit, but you'll be greatly fulfilled. Mr. Kennedy, how are we doing on time? One more question. All right, then you have to tell us the... Uh the story of you going to Israel and the Shmuel yeah. Press. <laughs> so this is a fun story. We all know about the Israeli-Palestinian divide. Well, I'll, I'll start it with a joke. Not really a joke, but it's just kind of, this is how me and my wife think. So my son, my youngest son, Chasen, is one. He's turning one. I remember this day, March 18th um, in 2006. Um, and we're at, we're at dinner at Tao, which is a hip, you know, great, cool, you know, tall ladies and dressed to the nines men type of place. And we're just having fun, a fun time. And all of a sudden, these 15 guys in black suits walk in, they canvas out to that corner, that corner, one goes upstairs and they're, they're walking by looking everybody in the eye. And we're thinking to ourselves, uh oh, you know, what's going on here? And somebody walks in, we can't tell who it is. And eventually, we realize it's Shimon Perez, who is the former prime minister, now the president of Israel. And someone comes over and says to me, uh, Mr. Perez would like to meet you. I'm like, oh, of course, I'd love to go meet him. So I go over, I say hello, and he says to me, my people tell me that you're the best. I said, if, yeah, if, yeah, okay, I, I, ta I take that. <laughs> he, he said, I don't know much about American football, but I have a twin sports school in Israel, which pairs Palestinian and Israeli kids together to help bridge that generational and decades and centuries old divide between Palestinians and Israelis. And I'd like you to come see our program. And so we're sitting there and a week later and trying to, should we do this? Should we go? Should we, should we, I don't know, it's Israel, I don't know. Should, should we go? Um, and we finally decide that we will go. And so me and my wife, who is Asian, decide we're going to fly on El Al, which is the safest airline in the world, mainly because of the screening process, with, which we experienced firsthand. So we go to the El Al terminal at JFK. I walk up, African-American. My wife walks up, Asian. Uh, my manager, who is Jewish, he's Ita Jewish. His wife, who is Jewish, and a short Italian guy who's our security guy who definitely looks like he's carrying a gun. We walk up, and we say, 
we're going to see Shimon Perez in Israel. <laughs> and they say, okay, you go come with me, you come with me, you come with me. 45 minutes later, we get to the check-in counter where they finally give us our tickets and corroborate our stories and why we know each other and why we're going to Israel. And we go, and we have an absolutely wonderful time and really feel like you're walking in the steps of history. If you've never been to Israel, I, I, I would recommend it, but I'd, I'd wait till there's, you know, not unrest. Um, but it was a beautiful city to see the Temple Mount, to see that Palestinian and Israelis, who you can't tell apart unless you know, um, worship at a place that is 200 yards apart, the Temple Mount and the Wailing Wall. It's literally across the street. Yet there's this generational divide that, uh, that will take generations to come to heal. Um, we went into uh, the Palestinian side down um, where there is little or nothing. Uh, it's arid. There was uh, no uh, running water. There's, there's no vegetation. There's nothing there. And we pull out a football. And we're standing on the top. And that, there's this great picture of me throwing this football. It's right when I release it. There's this little kid standing on the other end who has no idea what football is. But the one thing he did know was that I was somebody important and that I cared. And that meant a lot to me because it showed that regardless of whether or not people know who you are or, or your influence or power in the world, they just want to be cared for. And I see it on a local level. And after going to Israel, I saw it on an international level. And uh, Tiki's book, are we have time for questions? All right. Tiki's book is a great book. I think we have 80 copies here. But before I open it up to questions, I want to close with something that sort of revealed it to me, uh, revealed itself to me in this book. The title of this public program is Sports and Public Service. So you're sort of asking yourself, well, where is this public service component? Even though that Tiki did talk about it. Every Thursday, we have a class here at the Clinton School called Law and Ethics and Public Service. And Dean DePippa brought in a panel of religious leaders that led to a good discussion about many issues, one of them being common ground. As defined by Bishop Anthony B. Taylor, the common ground is the shared good of all residents in the community, the nation, and by extension, the entire human family. Very few of you have had the pleasure to meet Tiki Barber, but most of you have seen him on TV. Although Tiki has directly given enormous amounts of money and time back to his community, I wanted him to share his life with us because indirectly, Tiki has been an outstanding public servant and role model to so many of our nation's young kids. Being in the public eye is not easy, and throughout his career, Tiki has exceeded expectations. Honoring the two-word blessing from his mother, Tiki played proud both on and off the field. Not only did he become a great NFL running back, but more importantly, he has become a great citizen. So let's hear it for Tiki Barber. Thank you, sir. Questions? Where's there's the mic right here? Go ahead. Here you go. Last night we listened to Roland Martin, and he talked about our charge that each of us should accept. And there are four men, including you, that have had the same common denominator of not growing up with your father. That's our governor, Mike BB, Jesse Jackson, Barack, and Bill Clinton. Yeah. How do you see that fraternity of the lack of brotherhood in not having a father can help the thousands who probably went to prison because yeah. they never caught the glimpse of what you can be? Well, I think, first of all, for those who you mentioned, it's an enormous testament to their mothers. And just like with my mother, who took on the responsibility of being my mother, my father, uh, my soulmate, my uh, disciplinarian, everything all encompassing the mother. But for those who don't grow up with fathers and fall into the traps of uh, the ills of society, it's a, it's a difficult proposition to give people a choice and then not hold them accountable. And I think when you grow up without a father, that lack of accountability comes to a forefront. 
it's easy um, in our communities to ignore what's going on next door, to um, say, well, that's you know, Mrs. Jones's problem. Where is an, even, I remember when I was young, and it's vastly different now, I'm sure when you were young, when you messed up, you got that, that spanking every house until you got to your house. And then it was worse when you got home. I think it, it's, it's somewhat of an indictment on society that we don't care about our communities individually anymore. We should, because what happens when you don't is that people fall by the wayside. I'll give you a Michael Vick story, uh, or, or uh, example. Michael Vick grew up in the hood, essentially. And while he is a good kid, he would see people selling drugs, shooting others. They would go to jail. He would see people raising dogs and fighting them, and nothing ever happened to him. So his expectation of what is right and wrong, even though we as intelligent people can see that all three of those are wrong, his interpretation of what's right and wrong is colored by what was presented as right and wrong. Selling drugs, shooting people is wrong. Raising dogs, that's not wrong. So as a community, we have to define what, what is right and what is wrong. Because otherwise, kids fall by the wayside and they end up in jail for things that they don't think they're doing wrong. Um, but in a larger sense, uh, we, we need role models, we need mentors. Uh, and it, that's what I think is a bigger responsibility for those who have made it. Go be a mentor. It, it really won't take much of your time, six hours out of a, a week maybe, to tell a kid what's right and wrong and hold him accountable for it, especially if he doesn't have a father. Another question? Mr. Green. You, you, you did a great job hitting on it, but uh, really speak to the importance of extracurricular activities yeah. and especially sports in today's world yeah. and what it does for kids and maybe where you would be without. Well, I think sports and extracurriculars, we're, we're a growing nation. We're, we're getting huge, and there's very few ways to differentiate yourself. And I think in a different sense, there's very few ways to find your passion if you don't try everything. I played everything when I was little. I played soccer, which I wasn't good at. I played basketball, which I really sucked at. Um, but I found it in football um, because I tried everything. But I think on a larger scale, too, is it sports gave me a discipline. You know, why was I so good as a, as, an, as a student? Because as an athlete, I knew I had a schedule. I had to do this, 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 and this, and then I could go play. And being able to transfer that same schedule, that same ideal, which, which is why athletes are so good at speaking and giving examples, is because we live this life that is that we everybody lives, but ours is on immediate schedule. So you take that same schedule, I got to do this, 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 and this, apply it to other parts of your life, and it gives you a focus. It gives you a goal, most importantly, to be successful. And so when I tell kids. When I talk to kids, they ask, you know, how did you become such a good athlete? And someone else will say, well, how did you become such a good student? I said, because as a football player, I set a goal for myself. I want to do this. I want to rush for 100 yards this week or two touchdowns. But then I'd also have another sheet, same goals for school. I want to make an A in my math class. I want to do this. And if you look at it and you see it and you can visualize how you're going to get there, it's much easier to get there instead of wandering, trying to find your path or trying to take shortcuts. We have this great quote in our state, in our locker room, and it says, the path to success would be a lot more crowded if so many people didn't get off looking for a shortcut. So many people look for shortcuts in life, but when you realize the quickest way is just to go the right way. Okay. Hi, Tiki. Get you next. First off, I wanted to thank you for, for coming. We appreciate your, your being here to be. today. Uh, my question is actually a, a text from a friend of mine that couldn't be here. It's a football-related question that you've probably been asked a few million times. Perfect. And Will that the Giants is, repeat? Well, it, it's actually about the Giants. And okay. uh, her question was, do you wish you would have hung around another year I don't. And, and gone to the Super Bowl? And, and I've, I've been asked that question so many times in my life. But here's, here's the truth of it. I didn't love football anymore. And quite honestly, if I had stayed another year, unless I was just on the team and not playing, the Giants probably wouldn't have made it to the Super Bowl. Because 
when I was there, I, I, I wouldn't give my, I wouldn't let anybody else play. You know what I mean? When I was a running back, I, it's like Brandon would come in. I'd say, no, Brandon, I want to go to do this. And I'd do it well. But what you realize is that teams aren't about individuals. They're about people stepping up and filling voids. And so when I left, there was a big void. But an amazing thing happened is that everybody else took an added responsibility, which made the team better. On another level, I couldn't do it anymore. I was 30, I would have been 32 years old. My last season, uh, and this is telling of, this is telling why I retired. Um, we played the Philadelphia Eagles. I got the crap beat out of me in that game. For a week, I couldn't get off the pillow without lifting my head up. I saw a chiropractor on Monday, a massage therapist, our team doctor who made sure nothing was broken. So for five days, I was seeing doctors. And I told my wife, I can't do this anymore. Because one day she asked me, let's take the kids outside to the park and go play. And two things. I didn't physically, I couldn't do it. And mentally, I didn't want to do it. And that was that told me that the game has passed me by. I can't do this anymore. And I told people, look, this is my last year. I'm going to have a great season, but this is my last season. Um, so I don't think physically I could have done it. And mentally, I was ready to be done. So I, I went on. And now, well, the one thing I regret is that the media in New York, which um, became the, the, the sounding board for all media across the country, painted me as a guy who resented the Giants' success, when in fact, I was the greatest Giants fan, probably a bigger, more vested Giants fan than any Giants fan out there. And I reveled in their success just like everybody else. Um, I'm proud of those guys. I see a lot of them still. And, um, you know, I miss them. I don't miss the game, but I miss them, just like they miss me. Go we have ahead. time for uh, one more question. We'll you take a, two. Go ahead. You have a uh, wonderfully compelling story. How how different do you think your life story would be if you were an only child and didn't have a twin brother? That's a great question. It would maybe be significantly different, but I don't because I think my drive to be successful comes from what was around me, my mother and my brother, because. My mom gave us the independence and the discipline and the focus to be well in sports and academics, but my brother gave me the competition. And we never competed against each other directly. So when we ran track, he was a hurdler, I was a long jumper. We played, when we wrestled, he lost five, six pounds so he could wrestle in a division below me. Um, we played football, he played defense, I played offense. And so I would see him be successful, or he would see me be successful, and our thought was, there's no way I'm not going to be successful too. And so we always drove each other. We always pushed to be successful. And more importantly, he told me about myself. Not in a jaded, oh, I'm your friend, I'm going to you know, blow sunshine, but in a real um, hardcore, you need to do this way. And especially as we got to the NFL level, I got that. You know, I'd have a bad day. I'd fumble twice, three times, whatever it may be. And people would be patting me on my back. Oh, you know, don't worry about it. You'll get him. And Ronnie would call me up and say, look, buddy, what, you know, tell me about myself. And it helped me focus on what I needed to fix about my career. Um, but we do that in everything. We do it in school. We did it in, in sports. We do it in our personal lives. And that's important and it's invaluable because the bond of twins is like no other bond, especially identical twins. Um, because we are essentially one person that was split in two by genetic malfunction. Um, and we, we turned out okay because of each other, I think. All right, so last one. Go ahead. Oh, my question's actually a little bit related. I'm an identical twin. I haven't used the genetic malfunction phrase before, <laughs> but I may take that away today. And I just wondered what it was like for you all to be on different teams. Well, that was probably the hardest um, thing in, to do because we were – me and my brother were roommates. We lived in the same room for 19 years because we went to college and we still stayed in the same room together. And then for the, the last two years, we were housemates. So I never was apart for him, from him. And in fact, we didn't sleep apart until my senior year in high school when I took my girlfriend to Disney or uh, King's Dominion. It was the first time in our lives. We were 18 years old. It was the first time that we had slept in different houses. And so we were inseparable. And then all of a sudden, we were graduating from college. And we, we know it's inevitable. As I was saying earlier, it almost happened that we, it wasn't inevitable. We almost got drafted to the same team. But it became difficult because I didn't have that sense of comfort 
anymore. And it was all of a sudden, I really was on my own. I didn't have um, someone I could sit in a room with and just chat with or not chat with and it not be uncomfortable or uh, to, to, to tell me that things were going to be okay or to, okay, you're feeling down, let's go do something. Um, and so our phone bills, this was pre-big cell phone, you know, cell phone deals were outrageous. You know, we were, you know, $500 a month, our phone bill, because we were always on the phone. He wasn't married. My wife was still, my girlfriend at the time was still in college. And that transition was the toughest one for us, and especially after we started playing each other, because all of a sudden it became, I have a job to do, and so do you, but let's not take it too hard on each other. Um, I remember our, the penultimate time we played each other, it was a big deal because we had both kind of established ourselves as players in the National Football League. And I was getting tackled out of bounds, and Ronnie comes over, and, and I wasn't going anywhere. He just throws an elbow and hits me right across the chin. I said, what, what are you doing? He's, he goes, he leans down, and he's like, I'm trying to make it look good. <laughs> I was like, all, right, all right, I get it. And, the, and then the next year, I had to run over him a couple times, and I said, how does that look? And I was just kidding. But it, that, that was hard because I root for him no matter what he's doing, just like he roots for me no matter what I'm doing. And for the first time in our lives, we're doing something different. I'm in TV and other things, and he's still playing football.